So let me show you a little bit uh, measured data, but uh, again, overall, in any of our uh, product, it's always finding you know, the right combination to achieve I isolation and uh, being able to have more than, more than one radio operate, share the same overall band. And in order to do that, um, uh, especially um, in, in a multi-radio situation, we tend to, uh, if we tend to pick up radios and, and, and maybe uh, they can explain more on the software side, but basically if we take uh, two radio cars and have them operate at five gigahertz, and as long as they, they are separated enough and, uh, and have um, good isolation between them and are not using uh, overlapping channels, we are able to achieve quite a bit of isolation. And let me show you the isolation uh, between two of those cards mounted on a similar uh, motherboard. Um, so here you can see this is uh, from one and a half to eight gigahertz. This is the 2.4. So you can see the 2.4, the isolation between two cards like that. Uh, you can see that it's about um, upper 20, upper 20, uh, only 20 dB isolation. But if you go to the 5 gigahertz, and that's the lower part, you can see this is about uh, 37, 36 dB. And the rest is, all, is better than 40. This is when we have the two cards almost touching each other. But uh, we, are, we are using, uh, uh, in order to get uh, two radios uh, at the same time, Usually we look in a situation like that where they are um, more or less at 90 degree, the two cards, and you can see that um, we are already, if that's 0 dB, 10, 20, 30, 40, we are already over 40 dB in isolation between the two cards. And as we go to 120, uh, it's almost uh, better than 50 all the way, a little bit. Upper, upper 40s. So the, from having the two radios all next to each other to 90 degrees and 120, we gain another 10 dB. So we are achieving isolations uh, uh, in order to get two radios to work without interfering with each other at around close to 50 dB. At what transmit power was this tested at? Transmit power? Sure, because like you're going to have like a larger back lobe if you have higher output, I'd imagine, yeah. right? Uh, the um, obviously, when you look at the link budget, you have the transmit power, you have the isolation between the two radios, including the antennas, and then you have the signal to noise that you know where you need to be in order to have the radio working at the right modulation at the right speed. So, and and you have the channel selectivity. When you take all of that. And, uh, but the transmit power is definitely part of the equation and some of it is being, you can control the power output in order to kind of fine tune the, the overall uh, interfering power so that you're gonna be just outside of that interference level. So that the other radio, the, the interference, interference uh, signal compared to where the radio, uh, radio operate, you still below that interfering, becoming a serious interferer. So it's always a fine balance and the power output is one parameters that you can control in order to fine tune uh, or minimize the interference. But you have the isolation, you have the channel selectivity, uh, you have the angular separation. So all of that together, you, you're able to generate enough isolation to have the two radios working uh, simultaneously. I agree with that statement, but I mean, the average user, I mean, they're not going to necessarily know that, right? They're not going to necessarily know what power and what channel to put what radio sure. on. And that's where the software comes in. I'll, I've, we've got a slide coming up, and I'll talk about the, the channel planning software, how that's automated oh. to make, that takes into effect, takes into account the effect of the, of the radio placement of the channel placement. Yeah. You're right. You can't expect an average user to be able to just go do that right off the bat. Yeah. Oh, I think this oh, is... Well, here's the slide. So, <laughs> sure. So, so the, the, the challenge is you want to try to get adjacent channels 
separate it with as best angular spacing as possible. You want to make sure you don't ever get adjacent channels on adjacent radios. So step one in the channel planning algorithm, 2.4 gigahertz radios can never be assigned at less than 90 degrees. You, if you remember what the isolation patterns look like, we weren't developing as much isolation at adjacent radios at 2.4 as we were at 5. So the 2.4, just physically, if you go in and even try to manually assign channels, you can't do it closer than 90 degrees because that's where we develop enough isolation to, to start to work properly. Um, ideally, at 120. So if you think about an 8 radio or a 16 radio device, you would normally place, if you wanted to have three 2.4 gigahertz radios, you would place them 120 degrees apart. And you're only allowed three. We don't allow um, reuse of any channel. So the channel planning software, in fact, the configuration control software, will not let you assign the same channel to two radios, and including when they're bonded. So if I use 36 and 40, well, then I can't use 40 anywhere else as well. So the trick is, and here's an example of what we're doing. So here, an eight radio device might come out of the box with two operating at, at 2.4. Radios 1 and radio 5, and those would be most likely assigned to 1 and 11. Right. Good channel separation, 180 degree angular separation. And then the 5 gigahertz channels, we might look, be looking to assign five of those, dedicate one monitor as a monitor radio, and then where do those end up? So what you do is you're, you end up trying to get channel separation as well as angular separation. And there's an algorithm in the software that when you go to automatically assign channels, basically builds, runs through, first saying adjacent channels are going to be forced to be, and I don't know where we start, I think we start at 180 degrees, like, actually I think we start at 120 degrees, and try to build every, every possible channel pattern with the channels, adjacent channels separated at 120. And you create a table of those. And at the same time, all of these radios have been monitoring the environment, they know how much traffic, what the error rates are, how many other APs they can hear, beacon RSSIs. So you take those channels sets that you can generate and you score them based on the traffic that you see in that table and you come up with a good one. Now on high radio count arrays, say the 16 radio count, you might be able to generate hundreds or thousands of, of possible patterns with the radios, uh, with the channels separated by 120 degrees. And the algorithm stops after evaluating, I think the number is uh, 250 patterns. If I looked at at least 250 possible radio channel placements, judge them based on the traffic that I've heard in the air, I'll pick the best one of those and stop. As the radio count goes down, you may not be able to generate enough with 120 degree separation. So you, you slide that down and say, okay, now I'm going to generate with one less radio. So instead of four radios apart, they're three radios apart. And you, and you do that as well, all possible channel patterns, score them against the traffic. If it turns out that because of the traffic in the air, a something with radios at 90 degrees actually works better than 120, you'll pick that one. And that algorithm just keeps letting the radios get closer and closer together until you've at least evaluated enough possible patterns, I think the number's 250, to pick the best out of the, out of the 250. So that's all done automatically. And so the, the user basically says, how many 2.4 radios versus 5 that I want? And by the way, we also have an automatic assignment for that based on the number of Xeris arrays and radios in the environment compared to the clients in the environment. We can figure out one or two or three 2.4 radios per device. So we can auto band the devices. And then the auto channel is a very complex algorithm that, that, that does this whole machination of figuring out angular separation, channel separation, weighted against traffic in the air, and picks the best channel pattern. With 802.11 AC, and I guess as 80 megahertz channels perhaps become more common if uni 2 e is being used, does that, you know, is, would there be any point in somebody buying a, uh, a 16 a, a radio array if, you know, how many channels can you get out of that five, I think maybe? Right, so well, you bring up a couple of good points. First of all, as we go from 40 megahertz to 80 megahertz, today with, the, with 40 megahertz wide channels, you can take uh, a 16 radio array, put three at 2.4, put one as a monitor radio. Uh, you've got uh, eight other radios left over. You can actually do bonded on six or, or five or six out of, those, out of those eight. So it gets increasingly difficult. The 12 radio device, you can have everything bonded at 40 megahertz. 
I guess to save someone money as well that if they are going, if it makes sense to use 80 megahertz channels, they've got enough AC clients, maybe not today, but maybe yeah, in a couple of years that instead of upgrading eight radios, they can just eight, upgrade. 80 megahertz is an, is an interesting conundrum. I think as a home consumer device, it's great. I've got lots of spectrum that's mine in my house and I can deploy a few radios at 80 megahertz and take advantage of it. I think when you have certainly in density applications, uh, the use of 80 megahertz because I'm going to limit my channel research, re reuse, 80 megahertz today uh, uh, with because of the weather band knocking us out, we've got four 80 megahertz channels. So suddenly 5 gigahertz looks as nasty as 2.4 when it comes to channel reuse and channel planning. Well that's for that Uni 2 e right? Is it? Right. So hopefully we can recover that, hopefully we can get more spectrum. You know, you get back up to six 80 megahertz channels, you, you know, it starts to make some sense. Yeah, and if the FCC releases right. the middle and even the 5.9 they're talking about. That would be wonderful. Right. Knock on wood. <laughs> Pray to the uh, to the spectrum gods, but you know I think the reality is, and certainly in high density, large public venues, convention centers, hotel ballrooms, and such, using 80 megahertz bonded uh, channels is probably not the wisest way to deploy Wi-Fi because you're not going to get the channel reuse. And then depending on the applic depending on the environment, and just enterprise in general, it may still be more advantageous to deploy 40 meg and get better channel reuse than to deploy 80. Yeah, and the kind of the irony of that is that the way the AC is marketed is the big benefit <laughs> comes from doubling or a bit more than double the channel width and yep. take that away and you've still got three stream versus three stream and yeah, you've got QAM or 256 QAM, but... you got to love the marketing guys. Yep. They just throw around numbers like everyone's going to get that. I, it, I mean, it's I understandable. Agree. You're not going to market right. otherwise. But. The vast majority of people don't really understand the physics and the, and the, and the detail behind it, but they got to put up big numbers to do the marketing. You couldn't really put an 1.3 gig USB asterisk and then it'd be a, a paragraph. Exactly. <laughs> so the channel planning software does this channel separation, angular separation to maximize that. And sort of to summarize what Avi was pointing out is when the radios are adjacent to each other, we're getting about 40 dB um, radio to radio isolation when you measure, when you inject a signal. As you pointed out with those graphs, as you start to create the, uh, increase the angular separation, you're going to pick up 10 to 20 dB as well. So now you're about a 60 dB at 120 degrees. Channel separation, because of the, the way the, uh, the channels work and the skirt, when you're, when you're getting the channels far apart, you can pick up anywhere from another 20 to 40. <coughs> so between two radios that are operating on adjacent channels, you've got anywhere from 70 to 100 dB, depending on how well the channel planning algorithm has worked. And so that gets you to the point where you can function. And